Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for showing up. My name is Vince Palomera. I'm a 1984 graduate of Bethel Park. And, uh, got that? Okay. And, uh, this is a presentation I am doing on the uh, Secret Service and the JFK assassination. And at the door, it says, were the Secret Service, were they able to protect President Kennedy and prevent the assassination? And the very short answer to that is yes. And for decades, we've been tying ourselves up in knots, whether Oswald acted alone or if there was a conspiracy, it becomes like a part of the game that, quote unquote, we're never gonna know. My personal opinion is that there was a conspiracy. Some of my research, some of my findings would lead one to believe, well, Vince, it sounds like some of the stuff is leaning more toward a conspiracy, but you can even just take the notion, oh, let's just throw it all out. Oswald acted alone, official history is correct in that regard. The sad truth is that of the Secret Service, which I do not denigrate as an organization, they're a fantastic organization, and let me just state for the record, even though a couple of these agents, I have a hard time sometimes believing that they were totally innocent of any wrongdoing other than gross negligence, I do not believe the Secret Service organization had anything to do with it. I mean, but I do think that they could have prevented the assassination, and this uh, presentation is actually very timely because there's a book out now called uh, the Kennedy Detail by Gerald Blaine, former uh, JFK era agent I spoke to a couple of times, corresponded with. And <laughs> quite frankly, with no delusions of grandeur, this book of his came out because I sent a 22 page letter to his very good friend, Clint Hill. Clint Hill being the agent that in the famous Zabruder film jumps onto the back of the car after the shooting you know, happens and you know, rescues Jackie and so on and so forth. I did something pretty bold in this letter. This letter was basically a Cliff Notes version of my research up to that point, because backtracking a little bit, making a long story very short in the interest of time, I contacted a lot of former agents, many of them that protected President Kennedy. And I didn't go into it with any hard and fast conclusions whether you know there was a conspiracy or no conspiracy, or they were negligent. I was just very fascinated with the Secret Service, and not to get into a digression, but everybody remembers they show the Wild Wild West Okay, it was about the Secret Service of the 1860s, fictional, but it still was in the back of my mind that I, hey, I'm interested in Secret Service, pretty, you know, for lack of a better way to put it, neat organization. So when I started to get interested in, in you know, John F. Kennedy, and as a side, uh, like the assassination, I started to look at them. And when I went to my first uh, conference in 1991, just as a guest, I was talking to people, and they're like, ah, oh, I wouldn't really pay attention to the Secret Service. I guess that's why the Secret Service is so secret, you know. I was like, I gotta do something about this. So I just started contacting these people. And this is before the internet even kicked in. September 27th, 1992 is like a day of living infamy with me because a special agent in charge of the White House detail, Gerald Bain, thank God I spoke to him because he passed away in April 93. I was, just, I was talking to him, just matter of fact, he said, you, you know, I was reading you know, William Manchester's book, Death of President, and Jim Bishop's book, uh, The Day Kennedy Was Shot, and The Warren Report, and so on. And boy, since like President Kennedy, bless him, it was pretty difficult to protect him. He ordered you guys off the car. He says, I don't remember Kennedy ever telling us to or, you know, order us off the back of the car. If you look at the news roll pictures, you'll see agents on there from time to time. I almost like, what? This is the number one agent in the Kennedy's detail. He wasn't like a buck private. He's like the, you know, Douglas MacArthur, so to speak. And I said, wait, well, it's time out. I need corroboration. Could just be one guy. He was very lucid, but somebody out there and using a defense attorney tactic. I said, oh, this one guy, where's the corroboration for this? So one after another, after another, I contacted these guys, either in writing, on the phone, so on and so forth, and with very rare exception, and even those exceptions aren't exceptions, as you'll see, they all said the same thing. He was a very nice man, never interfered with our actions at all. Oh, he never ordered us off the back of a car. That's hogwash. So I said, wait a minute, something's wrong here. There's these official reports that were given to the Warren Commission six months later, saying, oh, five months later, actually, saying, well, he did order stuff at the back of the car four days before the major trip before Dallas, which is Tampa, Florida, which you'll see some of the footage on this I'm going to show you. By the way, I'm going to be showing a video of uh, this little unique compilation of mine, and it's uh, rare motorcade footage of other trips, uh, rare WFAA footage from that day, black and white video, and some other things. And so when I started to compare the uh, official record, the unofficial record, films and photos, 
All these guys, you know, spoke to me and wrote to me. Total stranger on the phone. Many of these people believe Oswald acted alone. There's nothing to this stuff. Come on, you know, why are you wasting my time? It was basically very begrudging. Yeah, because I'm a stranger on the phone. Something like a telemarketer. Yep. Yeah, yeah, of course, President Kennedy, yeah, he was a nice man. Never wants to do anything. So this leads us up to the present time. In between that time, I've been into a lot of, in a lot of other people's books. Um, I was on the History Channel back in 2003. Well, what made Gerald Blaine write this book was when I was bold enough to send this letter to Clint Hill, it really ruffled their feathers. Because basically what it was laying out was, the good news is, Clint, it's a shame all these years you had this guilt. I'm really sorry to hear that you beat yourself up. You shouldn't have beat yourself up because if your supervisor didn't tell you to order you off the back of the car and create this mythology after the fact, well, then there wouldn't have been any excuse for you. Your hands were clean because you were told not to be there. They circled the wagons. And they came out with this book. And in the interest of time, I can't really get into it. My, my online... Um, work is almost like a footnote to this presentation. You, you, can, you can check it out for yourself, but basically what it is is he's trying to claim that the morning of JFK's funeral, there was a meeting with Chief Rowley, and before they went out to St. Matthew's Cathedral for the march with Jackie and the dignitaries like Haley Selassie and de Gaulle, they all got together and said, look, we know President Kennedy ordered us off the back of the car, but we can't make it look like President Kennedy was to blame for his own assassination, so cover this up. And that's what he's alleged in this book, that 47 years later, he's coming clean, and you know, just, he doesn't name me by name. He calls me a self-described Secret Service expert, a little derogatory, but that's his prerogative, First Amendment. And that's what he's doing in this book. He's basically, I mean, him and his friend, it really blew their mind that someone was out there contacting these gentlemen, going against their code, so to speak. It's a free country. They didn't have to answer. It is what it is, so to speak, you know, using the common vernacular. So... Getting up to the present time, I thought the best better way to do this would be, it's one thing to stand up here and tell you my you know, discoveries and so on and so forth, but I always like audio, visual, to complement, you know, just speaking, because I think that, that uh, that's a way to hammer home. It's that old saying, picture says a thousand words. So we'll start this out, and what this is, uh, I'll narrate it a little bit, it's about 35 minutes. It starts out with like a, what I call like a detailed intro. It starts out with a WFAA footage, and you'll notice something in particular about one of the agents from Love Field, Dallas Love Field. And it goes from there. And I have actually a couple audio excerpts of some of the actual agents that have now passed away, what they said to me. And I uh, don't want to give too much away, because you'll see it for yourself. But one thing I will say, you will also see something that aired in December of 1997 on ABC, uh, with uh, Peter Jennings, the current, then current Secret Service Director, uh, Louis Moretti, came out and issued an order to all agents, former and current, to not speak about presidents' private lives and whatnot. This really created, it ruffled a lot of feathers, what they had to say. And you'll see the anger they had towards President Kennedy's private life. Some people might say, hmm, they were upset at his private life. They're supposed to guard him. So use your imagination. But, well, here we go. We'll start this out. Jackie. And here comes the President of the United States. Jackie down the stairs first, the President about three steps behind her. Mrs. Kennedy with a pink dress on, a wool dress, pillbox type hat, accepting the roses, and now the reception line forming at the uh, President's plane, the ramp to it. You know, protocol usually has it that the uh, the president gets off the plane first and uh, walks three or four paces ahead of his wife. But uh, uh, this has been changed around somewhat on this trip. People have noticed that the, uh, the uh, uh, president has been allowing the, the first lady to get off the plane first and walking three or four steps behind her. It's one thing about uh, Mrs. Kennedy. There's no trouble at all spotting her with that bright pink dress. She stands out like a, like a beacon light in this crowd. The, uh, <laughs> the uh, limousine now is beginning to move, and uh, the president uh, and Mrs. Kennedy are riding in the back seat. Uh, they are not using the bubble, so it'll be an open limousine parade, apparently uh, through downtown Dallas. There goes the, uh, 
the uh, first car, Secret Service men walking alongside of it. It's our understanding that the motorcade uh, will be moving slowly enough so that everyone along the route will have a uh, good look at the chief executive. News footage was right black and white the, then, but several uh, amateur photographers the, caught the, the motorcade on color the, uh, film. Like Channel 4 had two reporters along the route. Bob Huffaker was downtown. In response to political staff, agents who usually surround the limousine were pulled away so people could see the president better. One reacted by throwing up his hands in disgust. Three times he protested what would prove to be a fatal error. Kennedy was killed by the third shot from a sniper rifle, well after agents, if they had been nearby. Agents who usually surround the limousine were pulled away so people could see the president better. One reacted by throwing up his hands in disgust. Three times he protested what would prove to be a fatal error. Kennedy was killed by the third shot from a sniper rifle. Well after agents, if they had been nearby, could have pulled him out. So it'll be an open limousine parade, apparently, uh, through downtown Dallas. There goes the, uh, the uh, first car, Secret Service men walking alongside of it. It's our understanding that the motorcade uh, will be moving slowly enough so that everyone along the route will have a uh, good look at the chief executive. News footage was right black and white the, then, uh, but several uh, amateur the photographers the caught the, the motorcade on color the, uh, film. Channel 4 had two reporters along the route. Bob Huffaker was downtown. Right now, the crowds have uh, completely filled all the sidewalk space here in downtown Dallas, and they are packed from the buildings to the sidewalks. You can see anxious heads poked out of open windows in all of the downtown buildings here, all the way up uh, to the topmost floors. By the way, uh, any fear that demonstrations may have marred the presidential motorcade here in the downtown area, at this point, however, seems useless. Here comes the first car with Police Chief Jess Curry and uh, Sheriff Bill Decker. And here is the President of the United States. And what a crowd, uh, what a tremendous welcome he's getting now. We can, uh, and there's Jackie. She's getting just as big a welcome. And the crowd is absolutely going wild. This is a friendly crowd in downtown Dallas as the President and the First Lady pass by. Huffaker signed Jackson. off. Listeners were told the next live event was 30 minutes away, a luncheon at the Dallas Trademark. But moments later, gunfire in Dealey Plaza. I heard three loud... From his hometown of Duluth in Minnesota, one of those questioning critics of the official version of events is Professor James Fetzer. The resurgence of interest in the death of JFK had repercussions when Congress passed the JFK Records Act in 1992 that created a five civilian member board entrusted with the responsibility to review and declassify documents that were held by the CIA, the Secret Service, the Office of Naval Intelligence and so forth. We know from its own report that it had some significant failures. For example, and the Secret Service, which deliberately destroyed motorcade records that would have revealed that the motorcade in Dallas was a travesty, a violation of at least 15 different Secret Service policies for presidential protection. This behavior on their part raises the most serious and disturbing questions about their complicity in the entire affair. From the moment he arrived in Dallas, the president's protection was suspect, according to Vince Palomara, a Secret Service expert. There was last minute changes invoked by the Secret Service involving President Kennedy's security. Specifically, agents were told not to ride on or near the rear of the limousine. Now these orders were funneled from the assistant special agent in charge of the White House detail, who was the planner of the Texas trip, Floyd Boring, to one of his assistants, a shift leader by the name of Emery Roberts, who was in charge of the follow-up car. You can see an agent, Henry Ribka, doing his normal duty, jogging besides the limousine, when in the follow-up car, you can see Emery Roberts stand up and wave him back. And you can see a very perplexed agent, Ribka, waving his arms in the air several times in seeming disgust. There was another last minute change made at Love Field, invoked by the Secret Service. The Dallas Police Department motorcycle outriders were told not to be beside the car. It went from four to six down to a measly two riders on each side. And to add insult to injury, they were pushed further back in the motorcade by those agents not being by the car, by those motorcycle officers not being in the position. It opened up President Kennedy to a field of fire from in front and from the rear. 
In the months before the trip to Texas, there had been a growing number of threats against the president's life. Despite the increase in conspiratorial activity in the month of November 1963, in the apparent red alert the Secret Service appears to be under in response to this activity, the agency acts in the opposite fashion and actually reduces the security and acts like no threats on the president's life are occurring. Why? Uniquely on that day in Dallas, the press, the camera crews, Kennedy's military aide, who would normally sit in the front of the president's car, and even his personal physician were all relegated to the rear of the motorcade by the Secret Service. In a conventional motorcade, the president would be somewhere in the middle, surrounded by security and the press. In this case, the presidential limousine was set right out in front of every other limousine, which of course is the reason why the Secret Service destroyed the records of its own motorcades when they were asked for them by the Assassination Records Review Board. The most suspicious behavior by shift leader Emery Roberts was to be at the time of the shooting in Dealey Plaza. Tragically, he actually ordered the agents not to move during the heart of the shooting. Agent Sam Kinney, who drove the fob car, admitted as much to me and told me, quote, exactly right, end quote. And all these deficiencies begin and end with the Secret Service, because they were the prime movers. They were the ones who were directing the security arrangements from Washington up to and including in the heart of Dallas during security meetings. They were the ones that gave out assignments, vetoed or approved of security arrangements. So the buck stops with them. At Parkland Hospital after the president's death, the media were reporting that the fatal shots had come from in front of the presidential. Generator, wave at the president. So you were down, uh, you were down under the viaduct, so to speak, weren't you? Well, we were halfway in between uh, on the grass, the triple under, underpass. We were at the curb when the incident happened. But the president's car was some 50 feet still yet in front uh, of you. In front of us, coming towards us, and we heard the first shot, and the president. I don't know who was hit first, but the president jumped up in his seat. And I thought it scared him. I thought it was a firecracker because he looked, you know, fair. And then as the car got directly in front of us, well, a gunshot apparently from behind us hit the president in the side, side of the temple. Did, did you, do you think the first gunshot came uh, from behind you too? I, I think it came from the same location. I, uh, apparently back up on the, the uh, uh, mall, I don't know what you call it. For the benefit of nomenclature, all of you folks have gone out under the viaduct, and as you turn, going under the viaduct on the left-hand side, there's some grass. Uh, do you think the shot came from up on top of the viaduct toward the president? Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, not, no, not on the viaduct itself, but up on top of the hill, a little hill. mound uh, of ground near the garden. How far away do you, would you say that is from where the president was? Uh, a couple of 300 yards, something like that? Well, being took place today. Uh, Dallas is off to your left. This is Main Street. This is the county courthouse and the jailhouse in this block here. This is the triple underpass that we have referred to. This is where President Kennedy Johnson, and I, as I understand it now, a Secret Service man, was shot at about, tw and Conley, I'm sorry, Conley was shot at approximately uh, 12.35 today. And from our eyewitness that you saw earlier, was shot from up in here. This is an overpass going over these streets. We call it our triple other pass because there's another one was shot from here. Was killed. The Secret Service agents normally walk directly beside the car on either side. We do not see any in this photograph, but usually uh, two or three Secret Service agents will walk on either side of the car uh, so that they are there to uh, spot any, anyone who looks like a, a troublemaker. Government sources now confirm. We have this from Washington. Government sources now confirm. The Secret Service. The President depended on Jacobson during his first summit meeting with Khrushchev. And he continued to depend on the doctor's treatment through some of the most difficult periods of his presidency. Both Robert Kennedy and the official White House physician Janet Travell tried to convince the president he should stop seeing Jacobson, but they failed. According to Jacobson's records, he last saw the president in Florida as he was preparing for the November trip to Dallas. Max Jacobson's medical license was revoked in 1975 after one of his patients died from acute amphetamine.
brought tragedy to the president and his family. It was in uh, August of 63, and Jacqueline Kennedy went into labor and prematurely delivered the baby Patrick. I was assigned to escort the baby up to the Children's Hospital in Boston. And about 8 o'clock that night, the president arrived. And in the meantime, we had learned, of course, the baby was 4 pounds, 10 ounces, and was in grave condition. And we uh, got into the elevator. The doctor briefed the president on the condition of his son, which was not optimistic. And we got off on the ICU unit. And we passed a room where there were two delightful little girls. And uh, one had severe burns up her throat. Her bib had caught on fire. And the other girl had a similar but separate incident with burns down her arm. and huge pods on the end of her hands. And, and um, President Kennedy stopped. And uh, he said, I'd like to write a note to the children. So the nurse scurries to the station and gets the name of the children. And Kennedy writes a note to each child. He just did this spontaneously. And he said, I, can you see they get this? And there was no fanfare. There was no photo op. Uh, there was no press release or anything. It was just a matter of empathy and concern for someone else. And. Then we uh, proceeded down the hall to uh, see his son, who, of course, died the next day. This was part of the dichotomy of the man. You could see so many qualities that just glowed that you couldn't see why he wanted to follow other roads that were so destructive. But after the death of Patrick, it was sort of like a metamorphosis in a sense that he was closer to her. And he saw him spend more time together uh, in the White House. Uh, she would come over to his office. I remember clearly one evening, and she came over. And I had never seen that before. And they walked back out down the airway back to the mansion. Um, and that uh, continued up to uh, the trip to Dallas. April 1974. Uh, where were you on the day of the assassination of John Kennedy? I was standing out in front of the uh, sheriff's office, which at that time was at 505 Main Street. They've moved it since then, but uh, it was at 505 Main Street, directly in front of the front door. Uh, was the motorcade passing that area at that time? No, we had to wait about 15 minutes before the motorcade arrived. But uh, the sheriff had sent us out there that early to wait. Uh, were you merely a spectator? Or were you on duty? Uh, well, no, I was on duty. But uh, a couple hours before Kennedy was to arrive, uh, the sheriff called us in, what I call the street people, the plainclothesmen, the detectives. And uh, he instructed us that we were to stand out in front and in no way take part in the security of that motorcade that we were merely spectators and nothing more. Did that seem unusual to you? It did to me at the time because uh, there were so many people around and so few Dallas police officers. This is one of the first things I noticed was the lack of Dallas police officers try to keep the people back. Adley Stevenson, who had been assaulted in Dallas the previous month, and others, including Congressman Henry Gonzalez, from San Antonio, Texas, had warned President Kennedy not to travel through Dallas. But the Secret Service told the President that he had nothing to worry about, since the greatest security in the history of the country for an American President, comprised of the coordination of all the local and federal police, had been set up for Dallas. Yet Roger Craig, an intelligent, instinctive police officer, and many other police officers, were specifically told not to take part in the security that day. And Dallas-based FBI agent James Hostie, assigned to Lee Harvey Oswald, Oswald who had just returned from the Soviet Union, Oswald who was a high security threat by FBI standards, Mr. Hostie had no assignment to protect the president that day either. 
Hosty told a congressional investigating committee many years later that he was having lunch down the street when the president was killed. The greatest security ever? Even the normal security on both the federal and local levels had been stripped away. Another short one for you, another four minute DVD. But what I want to do is, again, it's one thing to come up here and espouse things, you know, say things, and that, but picture says a thousand words. And it's, it's the great conundrum. Now, I said before, you know, about the conspiracy, no conspiracy, and it's separate from that. It's a matter of the guys would have protected the president, he would have lived whether Oswald act alone or not. There is a little bit of a gray area in there. And it depends, quite frankly, sometimes it depends on my mood or if some of my researcher friends uh, work on me a little bit to make it, me think it is sinister. I don't know. I mean, you try to put the best foot forward and say they screwed up and the president was killed under their watch. And after the fact, they created this mythology that he was difficult to protect. And that's when you read William Manchester's massive best selling book. It sold like in the millions. You know, Day Kennedy was shot, even the Warren Report to a certain extent laid out this thing that, oh, President Kennedy, that's a shame, but you know, he did not want you know, protection. Now, you didn't hear me get into the bubble top. That does seem to be something that. Kennedy didn't want all the time, but even that is a gray area. There's many trips. You'll see a couple of them coming up. Where he had the bubble top on, if not in a full compartment, which he did quite often, a lot of other times he'd have it in a partial configuration where he'd have the rear piece on and the forward piece. Now, even though it was not bulletproof, it would deflect a bullet. And many of the agents I spoke to said it would deflect a bullet, or at the very least, actually two things, or it would uh, have a sun's glare off the uh, bubble would, would act as a deterrent, or just the fact that many people thought it was bulletproof. What a potential sniper or snipers think twice, if not thrice, about doing anything. Oh, the bubble top's on, or the rear piece is on. So there you go. Many times, um, you'll see coming up, uh, Kennedy was allotted many motorcycles that surrounded the car. It was protocol. In fact, on the Texas trip, San Antonio, Houston, and that morning in Fort Worth, the morning of the assassination, he had motorcycles all over the place in the high select committee. This is kind of, well, it's not buried. Researchers know about it, but it's buried in their um, report. Most people know about the Warren Report. High select committee reinvestigated the assassination in the late 70s and found a probable conspiracy, but very inconclusive, very unsatisfying. But one of the things they found was it was, quote, uniquely insecure what the Secret Service did with the allotment of motorcycles. And guess what? They blamed it on Kennedy. They said, hey, Kennedy didn't like this noise of the motorcycles by him. He couldn't have conversation. Geez, it must have been a new thing because he didn't mind having his motorcycles all around him up to and including the morning of the murder. He gets to Dallas. Hey, I want to hear now. Hey, get these motorcycles away. Hey, I didn't mind the, the agents beside me here. Oh, get them away now. And uh, yeah, the press and photographers, you wouldn't need Abraham Zabruder. Normally, the press and photographers were in front, and you'll see in a second. Again, pictures, you don't have to... Believe me, you'll see for your own. The vantage point, a lot of times there was a flatbed truck in front of the motorcades to capture. They would have the national and international press, or just like the local press and the photographers capturing the motorcade. You wouldn't need all these amateurs. Hmm, they were moved to the last minute. Tom Dillard even testified to the Warren Commission that, that left them in Chevrolet convertibles that put them totally out of the picture, literally, because they were stuck way back in the motorcade. They didn't even know what happened until it was too late. If they would have been in front, they would have been filming, hey, and they would have saw everything. Again, you might say, what's motorcycles got to do? If there was a sniper, it's a sniper. No. What it was, there would have been more professional witnesses to cover. Now, they would have covered them on the sides. Yes, you're right from a sniper's perspective. But if agents, now the Secret Service has even admitted this. So it wasn't like, oh, this is your theory about what they would have done. The Secret, Louis Moretti testified in the late 90s about this, okay? That if agents would have been on the back of the car, it would have obscured Oswald's view. So agents being there would have been very important. And again, so it's their own words. But again, before you know, anyone thought twice about this, they would throw out, well, President Kennedy, God bless him, it's a shame, but you know, he didn't want this protection. But as you see, he didn't have a problem at all. And I'm contacting these people. And here's the most important thing of all, especially if you go out and you get Gerald Blaine's book, which I'm not, you know, spas and dates, free country, get it if you want. You know, and if you go in there and you read and you say, well, you know, we had a code, he's talking about the Secret Service, and, uh, you know, that code shouldn't be broken. And, you know, I'm, I'm waiting 47 years to tell you that President Kennedy did indeed order us out the car and we covered this up. The thing he left out of the book, the, the real glaring error is, what about the non-Secret Service agents that said President Kennedy never wore us the car? You know, uh, Dave Powers, who was on every trip Kennedy uh, talk, he was riding in the fob car often, writes to a total stranger and says, they never had to be told to be, get off the back of the car. Congressman Sam Givens, again, total stranger, writing to him, 
said that agents rode on the rear of the car all the way. He was, he was sitting a foot away from Kennedy. He never heard any order. So I'll wrap this up with a little four-minute DVD. Now, this, what this is, this is silent, and it's four minutes long, and it's a compilation of prior motorcades, mostly in 1963. And, again, don't need the sign on this, so I'll turn this all the way down here. I'll do a little narration on that, too. <clears throat> Okay, this is Bogota, Colombia. Two agents, Bob Lilly, Roy Kellerman, on the back of the presidential limousine. There's the full bubble top. Excellent motorcycle formation, close follow-up car. Sam Kinney was driving that follow-up car. He was maintaining, maintaining the normal distance. Bright, sunny day. Bob Lilly told me that many times the bubble top was on either partial or full. We're talking about the president of the United States. I'm not a holy. Who had waited hours to see the president. The man dedicated to the defense of peace and freedom. A unique six-piece plexiglass bubble top roof was designed to be assembled in several configurations. A vinyl covering was occasionally placed over the bubble top, but this full-size removable hardtop was generally used when the Lincoln was transported by air. The spare tire was designed into the rear of the car, as the trunk space was essential for storing the bubble top sections and communications equipment. Rear deck grab handles were also installed at that time. This group was later reduced to six, representing the Secret Service, the Army Materials Research Center, Pittsburgh Plate Glass, and Hessen Eisenhardt. Careful consideration was given to all proposals regarding the presidential vehicle, but the most practical was to rebuild the SSX-100 as there wasn't sufficient time to design and build a completely new limousine for President Johnson. Plans were quickly approved by the White House and the car was returned to Hessen. And the man are inextricably linked. The memories of one stirring images of the other, specifically designed with the Secret Service in mind. It came with foot stands and detachable grip handles that could be fitted to the trunk. For a generation of baby boomers, John Fitzgerald Kennedy represented a hopeful future, better opportunities, and a... Internationally, Kennedy's patience and diplomacy were also being sorely tested. Almost immediately after taking off a symbol of America's power, his 1961 Lincoln... Got ...his car with him, and that car and him as president, it all comes together to stand for America and be what America is our country's greatest losses. 